Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to lecture two of SIDE slash ASDA's Multicultural Awareness and Sensitivity Lecture Series. Thank you all for being here this evening. My name is Giselle Murillo, and it really is an honor to be a part of this lecture series. I believe each of these topics are extremely important and they really need to be talked about more in order to truly uh, make a positive impact in society. And so today I, along with Ava, will be discussing how race and ethnicity um, are factored into health disparities. We hope you enjoy this presentation. And if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box below. And our moderator, Evelyn, will be um, answering or reviewing the questions. But we will save time at the end of the lecture. Uh, if you want to ask your questions and unmute yourself, you can do so at the end of the presentation. Okay, so our general outline for the presentation is that I'll spend the first half um, reviewing what are racial and ethnic health disparities, what can be done to dispel these disparities, and then Ava will take the second part of the presentation and she'll talk more about how this applies to dentistry and then um, talk about implications and future goals. Okay, so a little bit about myself. I'm a D3 dental student. I enjoy working out and baking. I have a huge family that I'm super close to and they mean absolutely the world to me. Uh, here are just a couple of them pictured uh, with me at my white coat ceremony. I'm Mexican and was uh, born and raised in Oxnard, California. My family immigrated from Mexico to the US when they were about eight or 10 years old. Um, and so this topic really hits home for me because as I become more educated on these topics, I have a better understanding as to why several of my family members fail to visit the dentist annually or fail to schedule an appointment with their doctor every time they feel sick. And um, receiving adequate health care wasn't always the case for my parents when they immigrated. And it's definitely not the case for a majority of my family members now. In fact, many of them struggle to afford the costs that come along with dental and doctor visits, um, which force them to drive hundreds of miles across the border just to receive care, uh, cheaper care in Mexico. And as I mentioned before, I'm extremely close to my family and just like seeing the way that they struggle um, simply because of these social injustices that are put in place um, is what makes me so passionate to help these minority communities and provide them really with the health care that they deserve. Hi everyone, my name is Ava and I also thank you all for joining us tonight. And I am also truly honored to be a side educator and a presenter for this series. Um, a little bit about myself, I am a D2 and I enjoy painting, going to art galleries and cooking. And I chose dentistry mostly because of its artsy aspects and constant human interactions. And um, my parents and I are recent immigrants. Um, I was born and raised in Iran and moved to the US about seven years ago. And here are some pictures of me and my parents. Um, just to show you that we, we dress differently inside and outside Iran, merely because we're not coming from a religious family. And um, this topic it's important, is important to me because uh, similar to the US, um, in Iran, we also have a lot of uh, different races and ethnicities like Turks, Arabs, Kurds. And um, growing up there, I, I noticed that um, just by not coming from those communities or minority communities, I was um, unwantedly privileged um, being born Muslim and having like white skin. And um, I had like more, more opportunities to like healthcare access and like education and all that. And um, however, after I immigrated to the US, I started noticing that now I'm, I am a minority in this country. And there has been instances where me or my family have been treated differently or unfairly because of our accents or our Middle Eastern appearance. And this is basically how I relate to this topic. And um, 
it's really important for me to, as a, as a future dentist and a, and a professional, um, educate myself on this topic and be able to educate my community as well in order to be mindful about like how I treat my patients and um, how I treat my colleagues equally and just to learn um, to treat everyone as an individual. So I let Giselle begin the presentation and I'll join you in the midway. <laughs> Okay, so what exactly are racial and ethnic health disparities? So the Institute of Medicine defines disparities as racial or ethnic differences in the quality of healthcare that can stem from differences in geography, lack of access to adequate health coverage, communication difficulties between the patient and the provider, uh, provider stereotyping, et cetera. And this results in racial and ethnic minorities uh, receiving poor quality care compared to nine, uh, to non-minorities, even when insurance status and income are controlled. And so these disparities in the healthcare system contribute to the overall um, health disparities um, that affect racial and ethnic minorities. And what's even more sad about this is that many of these poor health outcomes are actually preventable and or treatable. So as you can see on the graph to the right here, um, you can see how minorities are disproportionately affected by various health conditions. So if you look at the first box um, that we've highlighted here, um, for every white person, there are two African Americans affected by strokes. Um, in the next box, we see that for every white person, there are two African Americans, 1.5 Hispanics, and two American Indians with adult onset diabetes. And lastly, looking at the last, box, um, for every white individual, there are seven African Americans and 2.5 Hispanics affected with HIV slash AIDS. And these three conditions particularly impact oral health. So as current or future dental professionals, I think we can all appreciate the importance of studying this topic. Okay, now moving on to a very current and striking example of racial and ethnic disparities seen in health today can be seen in COVID-19 associated hospitalization rates. So this is a chart from the CDC that highlights the health inequities that we see with COVID-19 hospitalization rates as of June 27th. And as you can see here that racial and ethnic minorities are disproportionately affected by the coronavirus such that hospitalization rates for American Indian slash Alaskan Native, Blacks, and Hispanic or Latino groups are much higher, which is represented by the first three bar graphs on this um, chart. And according to the CDC, the data shows that Black Americans are making up around 22% of COVID-19 deaths, yet we know that the Black population in the U.S. is only 13%. So how can this be explained? Um, there was actually an article that was published and reported new testing shortages, um, especially in California, from a lack of resources. And unfortunately, the communities that were hit the hardest from this shortage are minority and low income populations. And additionally, it's these same communities that have fewer testing sites and they don't have the leisure of utilizing large scale drive through testing sites because of um, lack of transportation and accessibility to a car. And the article further goes on to describe the disease as sort of like the Grim Reaper, where it goes out and it picks on who are the most vulnerable. But I wanna really emphasize here that it's not the disease that's going out and hand selecting these minority populations, it's the system in which it allows it to do so. And so there are these long standing systemic health and social inequities. And we see this in what is called social determinants of health, which is essentially inequities um, in poverty and healthcare access, discrimination, inequities in education, income, wealth, et cetera, that drive this gap in health and quality of life outcomes. Okay, so how exactly are these disparities occurring? So this is a model from the Institute of Medicine and it attempts to display how racial and ethnic disparities emerge. So um, let's say you have a patient who presents to your office with a chief complaint 
And you as a provider, of course, possess expectations and beliefs that have been shaped by your training and your experience. Even if you do not consciously think about them, they're still there. So essentially, these experiences really shape your perception and cultural and psychological sensitivity when evaluating your patient and determining a treatment for them. And unfortunately, this is also when prejudices and stereotypes can really play a role in influencing our judgment, and it opens the door uh, for racial and ethnic biases to influence the outcomes of our clinical evaluation. And so this lack of evidence-based approach is what can lead to racial and ethnic disparities. So where can dentists play a role in this? Well, first, as um, Mark and McKenna mentioned last week, there are disparities in oral health specifically that we need to address. But also as dentists, we know that dentistry is often considered. And so as dentists, we have the unique opportunity to detect many conditions um, or diseases before a patient's primary care physician gets to do so. So if we can work to eliminate these disparities now, um, we can make a difference in these communities before any underlying medical condition or disease goes untreated. Okay, so there are four main factors that can explain why racial and ethnic disparities exist. And these four factors include patient factors, provider factors, healthcare system factors, and social structure factors and systemic racism. So I'll spend the next couple of slides delving deeper into how each factor contributes to um, creating health disparities. And then also I wanna point out um, that there's a symbol for each factor, which will be indicated on the top right of the following slides to signify which factor I am describing. So we'll start off by pointing out two patient factors, mistrust and treatment refusal. With mistrust, a patient's trust and doubts about um, medical advice directly influence their willingness to accept their physician's treat, uh, recommendations. And um, some providers will take this hesita um, hesitation to treatment as it being the patient's personal preference um, to not want to continue with treatment, and therefore the provider feels less inclined to take responsibility. But what some providers fail to recognize is that this mistrust can actually stem from racial discrimination and history of inferior care for minorities. So for instance, um, for many African Americans, doubts about uh, the trustworthiness of physicians and healthcare um, institutions spring from their memory um, of the Tuskegee experiments and other abuses of black patients by white health care professionals. So to refresh your memory from what Mark mentioned last week, the Tuskegee experiments were conducted from 1932 to 1972 by the US Public Health Service to study syphilis. And what they did was that they purposely withheld treatment from a group of poor black men who had the disease in order to study the effects. So in this case, this mistrust is a byproduct of past racism and it's what discourages some African Americans from seeking medical services um, which ultimately contributes to these racial and ethnic health disparities. Along similar lines, a patient may refuse treatment um, because they don't confide in their, pro in their provider um, or simply because they have directly experienced negative situations with their care providers um, and has ultimately lowered their preference for treatment. So when a provider expresses either low expectations of the patient or low empathy, it's often felt by the patient and it affects their feelings about their clinical relationship. And in this case, um, for these patients, it's not that they simply don't want to be treated, it's that they might not feel comfortable. And so moving forward, we'll take a look at how provider factors such as clinician bias and beliefs contribute to racial and ethnic health disparities. So as McKenna mentioned last week, every healthcare professional knows it's wrong to be biased and hold minority patients to lower standards. Everyone might think, oh, that can't be me. I would never do that. And while that may be the case, uh, and while there may be a few that are very aware of their prejudiced behavior, 
the majority are unaware of how subconsciously they are actually looking for cues to confirm um, preconceived notions or stereotypes about their patients. So if you look here to the right of your screen, um, you see the results of a study that was conducted by Ryan and Burke in 2000. And what they did was that they surveyed 193 physicians to assess their perception of 842 patients. And what they found was that when they compared responses when considering white versus black patients, they found that African Americans were rated um, as more likely to use or abuse drugs. They were more likely to uh, fail complying with medical advice. They were regarded as less intelligent, less pleasant, and less rational. And sadly, this lends support to believe that with these mindsets and preconceived notions, physicians are actually diagnosing and making their treatment decisions um, based on patient race alone. And um, this is what might make them less likely to recommend treatment to them. And so next, um, as you can see on this chart of social determinants of health, um, I'll focus on the healthcare system and how variables within, such as language barriers and access to care, contribute to racial and ethnic health disparities. Um, so failure of patients and providers to communicate well may result in misunderstandings of patient concerns, misdiagnose, misdiagnosing, and or an unnecessary testing. And so this language barrier can also result in poor patient compliance, poor follow-up, and poor patient satisfaction. And on a personal account, I have noticed this frustration in my grandma, um, grandma's voice when I'm taking her to doctor visits because I feel this sense of distress that she so desperately wants to, her concerns to be heard and well understood um, and not feel like she's being disregarded simply because the doctor can't understand what she's saying. Um, and in a study where Spanish-speaking Latinos were treated by clinicians who spoke Spanish, they found that having a language coordinate physician was associated with better health perceptions, psychological well-being, and lower pain. Um, and access to care is another factor of the health system that we are all well aware is a problem. Even um, with equally insured, studies note differences in who receives better access to care. Um, and minorities, minorities' access to better quality facilities is limited by geographic distribution and patterns of residential segregation. Okay, so lastly, we'll look at social, structure fac social structural factors. So previously, we talked about social determinants of health and how health is determined in part by our access to economic stability, neighborhoods, health and health care, social and community context, and education. Um, and discrimination and systemic racism also play a huge role into this. Um, so racism has restricted the lives of minorities and immigrants throughout history, which is why it's no surprise that these effects are seen in health. Things like social segregation, where we have this concentration of racial and ethnic minority groups in areas of higher poverty, higher environmental pollutants, higher infectious agents, and other adverse conditions, which are all associated with poor health outcomes. And this type of segregation is also seen in schools, um, workplaces, and healthcare facilities. Um, other things such as immigration policy, where certain policies provide some type of segregation uh, by prohibiting or limiting the rights of certain groups. And so as a result, minorities are sort of confided in this bubble, if you will, where they are limited to many opportunities simply because of their race. So why is this all important? Why should we care? Well we must first understand how these racial and ethnic health disparities develop in order to establish health equity for all. There's no reason why one such race should be healthier than the other. Everyone should get the same opportunity to be as healthy as possible. And as future and current healthcare professionals, we must also learn to differentiate what may be regarded as a patient preference versus your own perceptions. 
So don't be so quick to think, oh, well, that's what the patient preferred. As healthcare providers, we need to do better. So we have this duty to keep our patient well-informed and lay out all options on the table, irregardless if you think that the patient may or may not accept the treatment, um, or you think that they may or may not be able to afford the treatment, um, they have a right to know and choose what's best for them. So I encourage you to reflect on your past experiences and really think about ways in which you can improve the care process for minority patients. Okay, so how do we go about tackling these disparities? Well, we can start off by first um, understanding how important cross-cultural communication is. It's as simple as taking the time and the effort to really try and understand how people from different cultural backgrounds communicate. What similarities do they share? What differences do they share? Um, and as you can see in this flow, flow chart, that cross-cultural communication is linked to patient satisfaction, adherence, and health outcomes. Therefore, when cultural differences cannot be understood between the patient and the provider, then the rest can't follow, leading to poor health outcomes. And this just stresses the need for why healthcare providers need to be culturally competent. Um, public health programs are also another highly effective method for addressing health disparities. Um, the CDC created a guide for how to reduce health disparities. And as you can see here on the bottom, um, they list which populations they are targeting, which include Blacks and Hispanics, low-income populations, et cetera. And the programs that they developed um, involve they're listed here in these boxes as well as the effects of these programs. Um, but the programs that they developed involve home visits by community health workers, personalized counseling, um, programs supporting neighborhood conditions. And the results of these programs were outstanding, showing health promotion, diabetes prevention, and reduced HIV and STD related risk behaviors in these populations. So as healthcare professionals, we can enhance the impact of these strategies by disseminating and tailoring these strategies to reach more communities and applying the lessons learned from these efforts. Okay, the next slide. Um, so one major take home slide on what can, be do what can be done to bring us closer to resolving these disparities are one, cross uh, requiring cross-cultural communication for all healthcare professionals, um, either by training activities or online programs. Because if we as providers don't see ourselves as potentially contributing to these disparities, then we may never see ourselves as part of the solution. And two, supporting the use of language interpretation in order to make our patients feel more welcome, more comfortable, um, and better understand, understand their concerns to better meet their needs. And then lastly, uh, increase the proportion of underrepresented minorities in healthcare, because studies show that racial and ethnic minorities, uh, minority physicians are more likely to serve minority patients. And so these efforts can begin with enhancing the education of minorities across all levels. Um, also by revitalizing efforts to improve matriculation and graduation rates of minority students in health professional schools. Um, and then lastly, to continue the support of programs that work to increase the number of healthcare professionals in minority communities, such as the um, Health Professions Scholarship Program. And so now I'll turn it over to Ava, who will talk about what this means in dental care. Thank you, Giselle. Okay, um, so now we're gonna be talking about this uh, ethnic and racial um, disparities more specifically in dental care. And um, we're gonna be talking about ethnic disparities in children's oral health and um, the types of procedures received by them as well as these disparities 
effects on um, among adults population and elderly population in tooth loss. And just to um, have a glance at these disparities, uh, I want you guys to look at the graph on the right. Uh, it shows the prevalence of untreated dental caries among children and adolescents by age. And, um, and uh, by age, race, ethnicity, and poverty level. And as you can see, there is a pattern um, among the races, like um, specifically um, Black and Hispanic um, children are significantly um, experiencing higher untreated dental caries compared to the white community um, in different ages. And moving on, um, we, I want you guys, um, like we want to go over some quick facts about disparities in oral health in the U.S. We overall, uh, it's in that um, black communities, Hispanics, American Indians, and Alaska Natives are um, generally having the poorest oral health um, amongst the groups in the U.S. And amongst children, Mexican Americans, and again, black children are getting the greatest racial and ethnic disparities. And um, for adults and untreated tooth, tooth decay, again, Black, non-Hispanics, and Mexican-Americans are experiencing uh, nearly twice as much as white people. And um, regarding the pharyngeal oral cancer, unfortunately, Black men um, have a five-year uh, lower survival rate compared to the white community. and um, regarding the periodontitis, again, same pattern, um, Hispanics and um, Black community are experiencing it much higher rates. And talking about, um, so we, these racial and ethnic disparities are evident in the caries experience of our young children uh, in the United States. As you see on the left graph um, that's from the National Center for Health Statistics, Blacks and Hispanic children um, are, are um, twice as likely to experience the untreated dental caries and Asian non-Hispanic community, the children are uh, experiencing uh, untreated dental caries about like a one and a half times compared to the white children and we know that like poor oral health can really have a general impact on children's performance at school and overall well-being as well. And um, so clearly these racial minority children are, are being affected by dental caries, but what is really contributing to that? Uh, Giselle earlier mentioned that there are contributing, there are several con contributing factors such as patient providers, social and systemic factors, that are causing these disparities in our healthcare. And um, there has been a systemic review performed at USC in 2019 that shows us, uh, you can see the graph uh, on the right side that, uh, that they investigated the pers persistence of oral health disparities for African-American children specifically in the US. And they were looking at um, different like barriers and facilitators that's, uh, that's contributing to these disparities and came up with three major categories that are familial, sociocultural, and structural barriers. And um, they figured that there is an overwhelming number of publications on structural barriers that are um, causing like barriers to access the oral care specifically for African-American children. So again, um, this is like showing us that there is a huge need um, for a structural and systemic solutions. And moving forward, um, we see that these disparities are not just limited to caries experience, but also the um, the dental acts, dental services that children receive, and also like the preventative uh, manage preventative procedures that they receive. So on the left graph, um, the dark blue bars are showing the number of um, visits by the children in different races. And the lighter blue graph is showing, uh, lighter blue, blue bar is showing the percentage of um, those children who received preventive services. And as you can see again here, um, Hispanics, Hispanic children and black children are receiving significantly less number of preventive services and lower dental visits. 
Um, so, and on the right side, um, this is a graph showing the uh, ch uh, showing the children receiving sealants on their permanent molars, and um, again, like Black, Hispanic, and um, Asian communities are receiving significantly less um, per um, sealants on their permanent molars. And we all know that, like, um, how effective sealants are for preventing pits and fissures, caries, lesions. And this is just, again, showing us that um, not only these communities are disadvantaged and, like, have lower access to dental care, but also not even receiving um, the, those preventive um, dental services, which can really, like, um, um, manage their, like, f manage their future, like, untreated decays and further like effects on their oral health. So it's just so clear that um, unfortunately these minority groups, especially children are at risk of tooth decay and less uh, access to dental care. And moving forward, we see that um, these disparities are not just seen in children, uh, but also seen in, uh, among adults and elderly population as well. Both figures in this slide are coming from CDC's National Center for Health Statistics. The left graph is showing the caries experience um, for the adult population. And as you can see, there is not much of difference um, uh, among different races for dental caries experience. However, for untreated dental caries, again, um, Black community and uh, Hispanic com community are, ex are experiencing significantly higher number of untreated caries. And um, talking about tooth loss for el elderly community, um, we see again that his, um, Black communities are experiencing a significantly um, higher rate of tooth loss followed by non-Hispanic Asians. And um, so, uh, just a note on tooth retention. We know that it's very crucial for us, um, not only for, for function, like for speech or mastication, but also like um, it's, um, it can have like psycho psychological effects on individuals um, and like losing a teeth or multiple teeth can, um, imp can have imp adverse impact on their appearance or, or their self-confidence and especially for elderly population who are like um, having a sense that are, are more sensitive. And as Giselle mentioned previously, we know that like a mouth can act as a window to the rest of the body and oral, oral health can really have an extended impact on the overall well-being of these minority groups. So it's really important that us as future dentists um, we, we, we be mindful about it and try to have meaningful impacts on improving the oral health of this minority populations. And so what we can do now, we've already addressed like how racial and ethnic, ethnic disparities are seen within um, health, in healthcare and specifically in dentistry. Through children, from children, childhood through adulthood. And one important area for improvement is health promotion and parental education. So like we can promote programs within schools or other public um, initiatives to increase the education about oral hygiene and importance of um, visiting a dentist in order to maintain a healthy um, mouth and teeth. And I think like dental schools can also play a really important role in educating parents and young population and um, also like provide some affordable oral care um, programs or ex uh, in order to increase their access to public care. And policymakers uh, can also work to address the systemic and structural issues leading the these unequal access to utilization of dental services. And as we have already mentioned, like a structural barriers are found to be like the major contributor to these racial and ethnic disparities. So advocating for um, policy changes can also be really crucial in, in order to work towards solution for these systemic problems. And uh, also public health, uh, we know that um, 
they they can like contribute to prevention and management of dental diseases as we've seen like before for water fluoridation it's been uh, one of the most successful advances for uh, in dental public health um, however still not not everyone is being benefited benefited from that and um, but we know that in general public health can really have a huge impact in like a larger scale across the country and um, there is a still work to be done and uh, we, we must be like really supportive of those public health efforts. And of course, research is another area for improvement and in order to expand our body of evidence, finding the underlying contributors and reasons uh, for these disparities and practicing evidence-based dentistry can help us to increase the quantity and quality of our evidence available and really investigate solutions that can um, hopefully improve these uh, racial and ethnic health inequalities. And here are some of the um, starting points and future goals that can uh, help us move towards the health, equ health equity. And I'm gonna review these in further um, in the next few slides, but these are, um, outlined here as inc increasing quality and standardized research, improving workforce diversity, and person-centered person care. So talking about increasing quality and a standard, a standardized research, um, we know that um, research can really help us to collect um, background information and help us with moving forward to a better understanding of these contributors and uh, allows us to really like analyze um, the um, um, the analyze the patient provider um, communications or relationships or different factors in a health system and um, however there has been challenges in research and one of the biggest challenges these days is um, not having clear and consistent data and um, that's um, and what like one of the reasons for that is because in many of the forms and uh, surveys or questionnaires we see that when you're asked what your what's your race many people don't really relate to any of the above as you see like in the picture here and they just choose the other option. And, um, and this has been uh, adding additional confusion and challenges to our research. Um, and it's hard to like, um, for analysis and interpretation uh, of this data to really see who is benefiting actually from this healthcare or who's exactly being disadvantaged. So we can incorporate incorporate more races in, into these um, surveys or forms and questionnaires in order to decrease the confusion and uh, or even eliminate that to see um, to to make the analysis easier also it's really important that we just don't look at the physical appearance and or ancestry of the person um, in order to determine what race they have uh, because um, again, it's a, um, it's um, it, it can relate to many other things like the birthplace, culture, social class, and different other levels. And about the improving workforce diversity, um, it's important to know. Uh, it's important to focus um, to focus that. Um, the diversity shouldn't be just among dentists or physicians. It it needs to be across all the healthcare system, like anyone who's who's working in a dental setting or a hospital, among nurses, staff, employees, and uh, it's really important because research has shown that um, patients um, show increased trust, and uh, it it really improves the patient care in that system where, where there is more more of a diversity. And one way in order to imply this diversity is by recruitment of um, minority groups into like health professional programs and um, workplaces. And last but not least, um, there is uh, this idea of person-centered person care, uh, which we treat each patient as an individual and uh, we focus on different factors that influence a person's oral health it's really important that we, again, we 
um, pay attention to different levels and uh, unique characteristics that make every individual our patients. And um, as you see in this graph on the right and this figure on the right, there are several factors that affect the child's oral health, including their um, community level influences such as like dental care system characteristics or social environment in family in family level there are socioeconomic status family culture child level influences there is the health behavior and practices of the child or their access to dental insurances so there are really like all these levels um, of influences uh, along with time and environment that um, that's making a pay, making an individual, and it's not just race or ethnicity or how they look or what they're wearing or like simple things like that. So again, as future dentists and healthcare professionals, we gotta be very mindful and um, careful about our word, wordings and how we treat these individuals that are, as our patients. And again, as Jezel mentioned er earlier, um, it's really important that we don't make decisions for them based on our assumptions or biases. And we really need to make sure that they understand what we're telling them and they really understand all the options available to them. And don't, we shouldn't just assume because like this person look in a certain way or um, they cannot like, they cannot afford some, some sort of treatment plan. We need to make sure that we are clear with them and really representing everything that's available and um, leave them with making the decision. And I want to end the presentation with a quote by esteemed novelist and activist James Baldwin. And he says that not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. And I hope that we can use this information to really face the facts and move forward towards the equity, equity for all, all of us. And I want to thank you all of us again for joining us tonight in the second lecture of site series. A special thanks to Dr. Ramos Gomez uh, who helped us with preparing this um, presentation as well as, uh, and also I wanted to thank um, Allegra and McKenna for helping us preparing for tonight. And we are here for you guys. If you have any questions, you can unmute yourself or put it in the chat and we're happy to answer. Thank you.